L'ospedale is what is known on the title page as a dramma burlesco. It was written by the satirist and poet Antonio Abbati, who was working in Italy around the mid 17th century. At some point, a composer got hold of this piece, and we don't know who this composer was. He made it into what might best be described as an after di dinner discursive piece which might not necessarily, necessarily have been performed in a theatre. I was given a copy of the manuscript of this piece by the musicologist Naomi Matsumoto, and she discovered the manuscript in the library in Venice, the Marciana Library, which is just off St. Mark's Square. Very little attention had been paid to it. A few musicologists knew about it, but Naomi was actually the first person to identify the librettist as Antonio Abati. The very title of Los Verales suggests something pretty unusual. It's set in a mental asylum, and the juxtaposition of the delicious, varied, characterful music with the social and political commentary is a really attractive prospect. La fortuna, la fortuna è sole, ma è sole, è sole, è sole, ma. The piece is, has quite a formal structure. The doctor arrives and each character in turn describes their symptoms and their ailments and then the doctor provides a diagnosis or, or suggests a prescription. And so it's actually quite a, a formal, rigid structure. So I was interested in ways that we could kick that about a little bit and give it more of an effortless ebb and flow. The four patients in this opera are each given a special scene to themselves. First up is the innamorato, the lover. who is given quite a schizophrenic aria, veering from the most sensuous love music typical of the 17th century. The poetry describes the lover being on fire, being feeling like ice, being in heaven, being in hell. The next up is the cortigian, the courtier, the man with a pain in his chest who is given a really funky instrumental bass line which those people who know Monteverdi's late secular songs might recognise. Almost a kind of tango feel to it. The next patient who describes his illnesses is the matto, the, the madman, the man with a pain in his brain. <laughs> It's also in triple time, like the Innamorato, but this time in much more speedy tempo. The text given to him takes us on a total flight of fancy, talking about rats and mice and cats. And the final patient is the povero, the man with a pain in his wallet, who kind of turns up as the surprise patient and reveals ultimately the problems with the medical profession and how to cover the costs. He uh, took quite a lot of time and care over casting these parts because we needed a very specific type of voice that could sing this music that was 350 years old. Um, not just the music from the opera that has its own style, but also the madrigals that were weaved through the piece. L'Ospedale features a lot of interjections from a four-part chorus, which was quite unusual in the context of Venetian, Venetian opera once you get to the 1630s and 1640s. And it's uh, reminiscent, actually, of the works of Orazio Vecchi and Adriano Banchieri, who wrote madrigal comedies, 
where most of the storytelling was given to four voices singing at once. We decided to beef up the score of Los Vedalo with a couple of madrigals by Gesualdo. The choice, I suppose, was guided by the fact that Gesualdo himself is known to have been virtually a mental patient worthy of a mental asylum himself. And because two sections of Abati's original text were not set to music by whoever the composer was, that's the prologue given by the figure of Sanita, health, and the epilogue also given by Sanita. Uh, we decided to give a spoken prologue which reflected the original text juxtaposed with a madrigal introducing the presence of patients in the hospital. And later on we decided to add one more madrigal by Gesualdo Merce! at a dramatically critical moment. we decided to skew the dramatic feel by introducing a completely different sound world. We also knew it was important that we had really great actors as well because the performance was going to be so close to the audience and also to really bring this text alive and this music alive requires a sort of really insightful and intelligent characterful performance in how you deliver that text. And I think in the end create an ensemble experience with the singers and actors that feels like the music is just emerging as naturally as possible from them without feeling like we're sitting there watching an opera. The score features, for the most part, one vocal line supported by one instrumental bass line. And that instrumental bass line can be realised however you like, using the um, historical information we have from the period. We've opted for a fairly fulsome continuo section of two harpsichords, two plucked string instruments, um, one of the guitar, one of them a fiorbo, a violone, a large bowed bass instrument, and a viola da gamba. And this gives us the opportunity not only of supporting the voices, but also of adding a little bit of melodic interest. So we've taken some liberties and imagined that the players in the 17th century might have added their own improvised instrumental lines. So you'll hear at some points that the viola da gamba is playing added instrumental parts. It was very refreshing to work with Solomon's Knot because there isn't a, a clear divide between musicians on the one hand and actors and singers on the other hand. The group has a commitment to trying to work without a conductor who is formally leading a performance whenever they can, which meant that it was important to sew together the musical and the dramatic elements really tightly in rehearsal and as a result create something that in performance felt very alive and very intimate and very immediate. So the instrumentalists together with the singers had to know what was happening at every moment, had to follow the natural ebb and flow of a performance, which gave it a tremendous vitality that sometimes you don't get in conventional opera performances.
It's interesting for us to hear this piece in the present day because its resonances and its subject matter, it speaks directly to us, or certainly that was how I felt when I first saw the text on the page. It addresses our concerns about healthcare, about doctors, about whether we should pay for the care we are prescribed, and also whether there is adequate provision, even in this day and age, for mental health care and the treatment of ailments and illnesses that we can't see, that don't manifest themselves in a, in a physical symptom. Oh,